Welcome to NavChat, the show for the New Zealand orienteering and navigation sports community. Hi, Gene. How's it going? Hey, man. Going good. Busy times for both of us. Yeah, a couple of moves around the country. Um, yeah. Yeah, as you can see, boxes, <laughs> boxes still stacked in the in the back there. But we do have time to do uh, another nav, nav chat, so we're just squeezing in at the at the end of the month. But yeah, what kind of stuff are we focusing on this month? Well, this month being summer and the time of street orienteering and and sprint series, we thought we'd take a bit of a look at sprint orienteering and hone in on that for an episode. Um, have you been getting out doing info lately? I haven't been doing that much actually. We're still trying to make progress with this this knee. Um, so it's been over a year now of not really making any progress with the ITB injury. And although I've been very active and having a good time at the gym and doing the cross training, uh, the running's still a very minimal part of, of what I'm doing. So yeah, that's really the priority and it's not showing any any end in sight. So we'll, we've got one more um, approach to take a even longer period of time off before returning. And if that doesn't work, then under the knife, it seems. Unfortunate it's come to that. Um, uh, yeah, so good. Yeah. So uh, let's should we should we take a look at uh, what what Renee has to 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 share our special guest for for this this month. Yeah, I, I understand Renee's done a ton of sprint course setting. Maybe one of the most prolific sprint yeah. course setting in the country. Yeah, that's right. And it all started with the Auckland School Sprint Series, which. We started while her and I were at school um, and maybe she was even at intermediate. I don't know. It was, it was a long time ago and she ended up getting, getting involved and was doing a lot of course setting and getting, getting pretty fast. And she has a, a lot of experience and I think some good ideas to share. So let's go and see what she has to say. Sounds good. Let's have a listen. Hey, Renee. Thanks for coming on. No worries, Jane. Uh, this month, Tom and I wanted to do a focus on course setting. And so we thought it'd be cool to talk to you about what you've done with the Auckland Sprint Series over the last few years and get some tips on course setting for sprint orienteering uh, will just be the focus for this one. So uh, you've sent through some some good maps to have a look at. So when did you get involved with the school sprint series and how many years did you stay involved? I think I got involved maybe around 2013 or 14. I think I was at uni and dad had been doing pretty much the whole thing by himself, maybe a help from a few other people with the course setting, I mean. Um, but it was just like a little bit too much. So I really love course setting. So I, I put, and we were living in the same house. So it was quite easy to discuss the courses and the, the maps we were using so I just started course setting and then I kind of finished it in 2018 or 19 um I didn't really feel like I could do it that well anymore like giving enough attention okay um because of time I was just busy. Just... yeah yeah I was just busy with other things and so we got Daniel Monkton involved um I think he was probably the main person we we got involved to help with um course setting and he carried it on, and now Lactic Turkey has sort of taken it from dad. How many courses do you end up setting over the six-week period that it runs? Um, oh, there's a calculation. Um, pretty much there was uh, three – I was doing three events a week, and each event was eight courses. So that was 24 oh, yeah. courses a week for <laughs> nice. season. And then the finals was oh, yeah. on Saturday, which was a double race. So I was doing like 16 courses for that particular day. Um, and that also includes doing like mat flips. So you're almost doing like double courses sometimes. It's like the same course, but you're having to do two separate ones mm -hmm. on when you're doing it on OCAD. So it was, it was quite a few. It was yeah, a bit, time was a bit precious at some, like sometimes. Yeah. Cool. So what did you want to tell us about on this first one St. Kent against College year 7 and 8 
uh, boys course. So both of these RNTAs are pretty new, I imagine. Yeah, so that this was one of the finals. So this was the sprint final morning for 2017. Um, I mean, even though I look at it today, I'm still like, oh, maybe it was too easy, maybe it wasn't. But um, you, you, you still, even though they're seven and eights, this is the final. They've been doing at least four races. Um, you have to ensure that they can't just see the control from where they, from the co control that they're leaving. Um, they're not that stupid. So they still have to have some route choice or they still have to wind their way through um, the buildings and they should only really come across the control or see it. Right. Um, when so, yeah, off. even this first one, you can't see there. You probably can't see because of these walls and there's the staircase. Yeah. You can't see through there. And that's kind of that behind, behind that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty easy um, because it's always on... Like there, there's not any big route choices, but it seems that maybe this is the only route choice, and it's kind of, it's kind of trivial. Yeah. Um, there was, I mean, there's some um, other seven eight courses where I probably did have more route choice than this, um, but yeah, yeah, like nine to ten is, is no route choice, but they still have to get around something. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not completely uh, beginner level, and do you feel like you ramp them up a little bit over the, the six weeks? And then yeah, the that's, what we, that's what we started to do towards the last few years of it. Um, I'm not sure why we started doing it then. We probably should have done it at the beginning. But okay. we tried to make the finals a little bit harder and also have things like spectator run-throughs and spectator controls to make it a bit more exciting for the spectators and also a bit more pressure on the competitors, even though they were at school and they've never experienced huge competitions, a lot of them, it was still um, still good for them to experience people clapping and running running through, which puts yeah. pressure on any anyone, <laughs> regardless yeah, it's of how exciting but terrifying are. at the same time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so this is another St. Ken's one, but this may provide some contrast because this is the uh, year 12, 13, so they're this senior kind of older level level girls so how would you describe this kind of course setting compared to the other end which was the year seven and eight stuff um i definitely enjoy setting the higher courses more because you just have more to play with and you're not as restricted on you know, oh is it a little bit too hard is it you know are they just going to be completely lost but when you get to year 10 11 12 13 it's it doesn't matter how many buildings they go around, they still can do it. Like the, even if you increase the number of buildings, they have to go around like by five times as much. It's they're still using the same navigational skill, like navigating their way through, so they can still do it. And so you can pretty much do anything, and they'll it'll be fine. So you're considering that from like year ten and up, is that right? Yeah. Or eleven and up, just go go yeah. as hard as possible. Like yeah. it should be just as as hard. There's not it's not a safety risk. It's uh, just a navigational difficulty at speed. Yeah, I mean, year, t year 12 and 13 is still much more, um, a bit hard. I had, oh, yeah. not like harder, you can't get too hard with sprintering, tearing, but the legs were longer um, and maybe I was doing a lot more sort of changes in directions, really tight little things. With It might not be a very hard mm. route choice, but they have to have made that route choice very mm. early on and have to just go for it. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So some of these legs here, um, they, there's some, some multiple ways to, to do these legs. So is this the kind of thing that you're, you're looking for when you create these courses? Yeah. I, a lot of the, yeah. oh, sorry. A lot of the, um, when it came to the finals, I spent a lot of time actually measuring on OCAD every single leg. Um, when it came to the year tens upwards, um, because I wanted to make sure that I was actually creating a root choice. Because sometimes you might go, "Oh, yeah, that's a root choice," but then when you measure it, you're like, "Well, actually, that way is so much longer." Um, and so you try to adjust things a little bit to make it um, a bit more, I guess, more pressure to to make that choice mm. when they're trying to run as fast as possible. Even the first control, it's like there's no little first control they have to. 
they run too easily it's like just straight into um the four root choices i guess you have there yeah i'm noticing a lot of uh, back and forth changing direction as well so that you had to keep them on their toes and the leg length changes quite a lot when you look at yeah. these short <laughs> the shorter ones here <laughs> um compared to like the length of these these longer ones that's that's quite a big percentage difference between the long ones and the short ones so let's have a look at yeah uh, i think it's i think it looks nice and it should So we've got a course at, at Carrington. This was another school series that you did at Carrington because most of them are at, at high schools, aren't they? Um, yeah, so this was one of the finals we did in 2000 and oh, maybe it was 2015 or 16. Um, yeah, it was it was actually really nice to have to have this new map. So um this was newly mapped. I'd mapped Matt Ogden had done a tiny bit and then handed it over to me and I completed the rest of it. Um, so it was new and it was in the sprint sprint version mapping as opposed to like the summer series version. Oh yeah. Um, and there's so many little nooks and crannies, all that like the little Look at this bit here, that's sweet. Pile of buildings at the very bottom where there's just all these little alleys. Um, mm. and the area was good so by the start finish area i had all the spectators at the top of the hill by all the parking so like yeah north east of the finish oh, yeah. it's like the slope and so all the spectators sat up there and watched everyone go through number 11 and then run to the finish so these some campuses and some areas are so much better to use the sprint maps than some of the more small pokey skills that we would maybe use for the sprint series and then keep this for the final. Sweet. And in case the watchers are wondering, this uh, the, the, <laughs> the background map was not the the map that they used on race day. We had to no. just bring up bring up a, a more a recent map. Um, number three was that was all remapped. That was all uh, yeah the previous buildings before we we're on the new map yeah. just just for this <laughs> it looks pretty it funny, was a though. mystery to get into the building <laughs> oh cool. and this is a example of a senior boys course so um do you think this is the kind of course setting that people should aspire towards I mean, it's kind of hard yeah. to critique your own courses but uh <laughs> was this one you were satisfied with at least um i, I can't actually see it yet <laughs> it's still showing me Oh, okay. The junior boys one. Okay, maybe a, a little bit laggy. Coming through? Mm -hmm. Not coming through? Oh, here. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I quite, I had a lot of fun setting um, these courses here because they had such a variety of the little complex group of buildings, then some bigger, really weird shaped buildings in the middle. And then you also had to the east, to the like the right of the map, you had all these big walls um, and gardens that sloped around with like, yeah, they were pretty much cliffs. Um, and it just, you have, you have to choose your way around it. You can't, even though it's not a building, you're still going to have to um, like wiggle your way through them. So there was a bit of, um, I guess, variety in the map. Yeah, there's almost um, like three different terrains, yeah. terrain types here, and then you've got this kind of parkland here, and then this is again a different style over here. So that's really cool, and you've really taken you know, advantage of those different areas with the kind of course setting. So you're using these long legs through the areas where the buildings are, are big and push you wide, whereas very short legs to force you through the small gaps. And you couldn't do it the other way around, could you? Yeah. Like you couldn't um, have a, like a yeah, long I mean, leg through here. It would waste it, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. You what you want to have that sharp, those sharp changes in direction. And there's so many controls in there. And there was this, there was heaps of controls in there. Like these are obviously just showing the five that are on senior boys. And so they had to be just so focused on their map every single turn. And they're having to turn around and go 
like different sharp like directions um, to keep them on their toes. So you definitely, when you have maps, when you look at a map, you need to go, okay, what different areas of the map are there and what different challenges do those different parts have? The last part of the map is super fast running. I couldn't really avoid it. Um, I tried to create some very basic route choice, like around that big yeah. building and stuff, but it was just like flat out. You're going through the spectator, everyone's cheering. You're now just like flat out sprinting mm -hmm. without mispunching to the finish. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine that finish area, it doesn't make that much sense to put some short legs in there because they don't really achieve that much more than just having these medium length legs to get them through. Yeah. Whereas putting these, these short legs in down the bottom is like really doubling down on why that area is so tricky. Yeah. And it like, I, we've all, I mean, both of us have been in it quite a few times and it's still, even though you might recognize the area, you're still not wanting to lose contact because you might just, you, especially in sprints when you're, if you're an extremely fast runner, you just run past an alleyway or a little pathway without even realizing it. Yeah. Um, and have to double back so cool. this is another one did you have some thoughts on this guy um yes yeah, so this is oh this is intermediate girls um yeah dio has this dio and then to the east of dio is dilworth unfortunately with dilworth they wouldn't let us use a lot of the building area um so it became a bit simple so i tried to just make route choice where I could but with Dio they've got some really obscure building shapes um oh yep they've got like where 16 and 17 are that big building it's just like really peculiar and then you have these gardens um and little stairs and walls around it um and you can make some funky route choices um where you end up having to weave your way around things um yeah, and so even oh yeah, there's quite a lot of yeah, it's pretty full on. There's lots of little decisions to make. Yeah. So and even with even though Dilworth was a bit was a bit average, having so much of it blocked off, I still tried to make a route choice from five to six, so you could drop south out of dio and hit the road and then run um back up into Dilworth through there yeah so and that's really the only way to use something that's blocked off like that it would have yeah. been like a waste to say oh it's blocked off and then just giving them a leg to like down here because there's yeah. only one way to do that and at least this way you've given two options yeah two options is a lot better than one option in our engineering <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you still feel a bit bad. You're like, oh, I only managed two, managed two options. But some of the skills we, we use, unfortunately, that's you don't often get a lot more than that. But Sweet. This one looks pretty tricky. Ibsen campus, Ibsen campus is always a tricky area. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think so we used it. Sometimes we used it. Oh, sorry, you go. No, no, yeah, I was just saying this was a, oh. quite a tricky area and the, like the course looks like you've gone pr pretty full on and really no excuses even for schools schools racing, um, especially at senior, senior level. This is really as tricky as sprint orienteering can get on this map. Yeah, we um, we did use Epson a couple of times for the finals, but this, I remember this one wasn't even one of the finals. It was like... The, se the second or third um, race. So a lot of people were still quite new and a lot of seniors were only, that was their first year doing it for some of the seniors. Um, so this one was pretty intense and what makes Epsom so difficult is it's on different layers. Um, it's not flat. So, and for some reason it, in your mind, it makes things more tricky when you have to go up yeah. and down things. Um, and there's a lot of little walls that like um, just kind of contour through you there. out pretty much. Yeah, it's kind of a, that height difference through there. I remember there's those contours there. Oh, yeah, that's up that big staircase. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, when you've yeah. been there a few times, it definitely helps. But if it's your first time there, you're at number one, you're, you're, 
you're miles below the building in front of you. Like it's mm-hmm. way above you. And the two people who are inexperienced that to them, that's just like a massive wall that's in their way. And they're like, mm-hmm. how do I, how do I get around this? Um, and to, yeah, to see that you actually have to climb a whole bunch of contours. Um, hopefully it, yeah, hopefully it, um, made it more challenging for some people. Yeah, no, that's great. No holes about. That's a fun. Linfield. Oh yeah, some classic field running. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So I imagine um, this just happens inevitably. Sometimes you're just trying to get a bit of extra distance because this isn't the biggest school. No, a lot of our schools we, especially for um, intermediates, well, you're ten and eleven and you're twelve and thirteen. We have to do flat. Um, we have to do flip maps. Oh, yeah. So you have to create essentially two different courses without using the same controls or making the same legs um, to get to the distance that you need for that grade. So with Linfield, it's quite an interesting school, but it's small. Um, and there's quite a, a, a few schools like that in Auckland where you you have complex stuff and then you, you try to do as much as you can in there without making it too complicated and lines going everywhere and controls everywhere. Um, and you still end up having to do an extra 400 meters of field running, which mm-hmm. I, I really dislike, but sometimes you, ha- you just have to use the field because you've already been to this control before. You've already pretty much done that same route choice or leg that you can't, just keep using it. And we only had 30 controls to play with for every event. Oh, so wow. you ran out of controls pretty fast with eight courses. Okay. So um, what I'm what I'm hearing is use all of the interesting bit first, then use all of the interesting bit a second time on the other side of the <laughs> yeah. page. And then if you really have to, yeah, run them around yeah. the field. But it's really the, the last resort to try to get the distance. Yeah. Yeah, that should be your aim. Definitely. Okay, we've got a got a root gadget, uh, senior girls. So, what did you want to share on this one? Um, it was it was more just a contrast of I, mean, I don't I can't remember who actually set this. This was uh, yeah. So at the top it says New Zealand Secondary Schools 2017. Um, I can't remember who set it, and it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. And I'm not trying to attack them or anything like that. But it, it is interesting when you do look at this, this is New Zealand champs. So that some of these people are are focusing on going to Jaywalk or in the New Zealand skills team. And a lot of the people in this grade would have been orienteering for quite a few years um, and still really experienced. And I found, I was just a bit disappointed with um, the way that the school was used. It's not the hugest area and it's quite spacious between buildings, but it could have been used better to make it harder a lot of the controls for a senior level especially you could see the next control and i ran this course as well but just afterwards um you can see the next control or you just have to go around one building and you see your control um right. and that's so not number how one i think senior. if we just go through them leg by leg you could probably yeah. see is number you can see number one from there and there's not really that much of a root choice. I mean, you could you could do that, I guess, but it's it's kind of it's not that interesting. Two, okay, you've got a root choice around this building, controls out in the open. You can probably see straight to three, depending on what these trees are like. Is that your recollection of it? Yeah, it was. I mean, you could see three, and you could see four, or where four was, because yep. it was a few trees, and there was like a pathway. So it looks like they've managed to achieve one root choice here um better than not having a root choice um on the other hand it's it's similar to the one you had at dio you've kind of got nothing better to do so it's just 50 50 um out and around i guess there's a bit of a root choice through there but it's still not that interesting that is not a stimulating leg this again is just we've got the whole field to follow. There's no decisions to be made for the orienteer around the edge. You can probably see that once you're in line with the fence over there. So mm-hmm. yeah, is, is that what you mean by it's, it's, it's kind of too easy to just stumble into the controls? Yeah. 
yeah, there was, you just sort of looked at your map, like by the, sort of at five, I'd already seen that number six, seven, eight, nine. You could already, you could already memorize what it would probably look like when you're getting there. Um, yep. And you almost didn't need to read the map the whole way. You sort of just glanced at it briefly just to ensure you didn't actually do something silly. But yep. like, yeah, that's something that even a year seven and eight could be like, oh yeah, I have to get around that building and they would go for it. But yeah, for seniors mm. or intermediates, that's not what Easy. it should be about. Yeah. All right, here's another one. What did you want to share about this one? Looks quite hectic. <laughs> if this is the same, this is the St. Catherine's then. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was, because I think it's, it's always good to criticize your own corset. And I think this is one of the things that anyone who wants to corset and wants to do it often and wants to improve in it, you do have to look at your own courses and sometimes like face palm yourself. Yeah. Um, because if you're not even criticizing your own legs, then it means you're not even, it doesn't really seem like you're that interested in ensuring that they're challenging or not too challenging for specific grades. So this was, this was one of my real big blunders that I felt actually really, really bad about um, afterwards. I'm not sure why I, I did such a blunder, but pretty much this is year seven and eight girls. Um, and this was their very first event. And the St. Cuffs is, is a relatively small school, but it's really, the buildings are really close. And there's a little, little um, like alleyways and there's a section near number 14 where there's all these sort of staircases up to different levels. Um, and I, uh, yeah. I made the course A too long. For some reason, I didn't measure really choice i just went straight line i have no idea why because the other races right. that week i didn't do that it was really odd and and i no. made it too hard for seven and eight like there's these quite you know relatively challenging like seven to eighteen these people have never seen a map before and i like forced them to potentially navigate around three buildings through like a garden um yeah. and pretty yeah pretty soon through the event there was a lot of people standing around looking really confused and people out there for 40 minutes, 50 minutes um, mm -hmm. and, and probably not enjoying it. And I felt pretty upset mm. that I'd let, let them down because I, it was so unnecessary that I'd just set it like that. It's a bit excessive. Yeah. It's <laughs> not that it's unsafe, but the, the goal is to have a, a good time, uh, especially yeah. on your first time, if you want them to be coming back. So it would have been nicer to have, instead of having 18, 17 and 18 there, you would have probably put 17, like maybe onto the, the court or something that's very, very clear. Yeah. Something to like get them around the buildings rather than just be like, okay, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Go through that jungle of um, different features. And it's not just physically like going through, oh, I need to go through these buildings or around this garden. They also don't understand a lot of the symbols on the map. Mm. And so when they look at the leg, they're also like, I don't even know what this means. <laughs> what is all this stuff there? Like, you might as well just scribble so it out if really someone's never there. seen a map before. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. And I'm, I, yeah, I guess in that situation, I just, I just went over my head and I was like, oh yeah, this will be great. Like, they'll have a great time. Like getting around this building will be no problem for them. And then afterwards, um, yeah, I was, I was pretty, I was pretty sad on the way home when dad was driving oh, me yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> let the little kitties down and again this is the yeah. second oh this is the first part of the course okay oh second oh, oh first, sorry that's the second start. yeah, yeah okay. i think the first ones oh yeah this is hardcore it's straight into this is the first leg of their orienteering journey in high school <laughs> it's like, yeah pretty much and it's just like wham um nice. straight into it so not sure why i brain farted yeah so much right so what i can did. learn is <laughs> there is a too hard and there is a too easy and for your yeah, seven and eight, it should be like <laughs> slam it to the too easy. Like yeah. it should be so easy. But for anyone at the other end, especially senior, it should be as hard as possible. There's never yeah. any reason to dial back, back the senior 
senior courses it needs yeah. to be stimulating and with the junior courses it's supposed to just give them a sense of what the whole sport's about so like it can really never be too easy so the hardest bits are the bits yeah. in between but yeah it's in order to get better at that i think you need the feedback like you were saying and you need to um re review the courses you've done and see if they were actually achieving the goals you, you thought they were yeah i i definitely think one one thing with sprint orienteering especially with school stuff where you've got people who've never done it in their life to people who are relatively experienced you might have like a root choice for your seven eight they can go around one building or two buildings but if you do like three or four buildings it's just it's too over it's like really overwhelming whereas if when you get to the 10 11 12 and 13 yeah. there's almost no difference between them going around five buildings as opposed to 20 buildings they're using like the same navigational skill for each mm. building along the way and it doesn't matter that it doesn't get any harder it's just a longer leg with more choices whereas for beginners it's it's just too hard like it's it's just too much going on and so it's almost a you have to think about setting them in different different ways they're using like different logic or i don't know yep. um ways of thinking about the course than each other when they grow older they yeah 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 that's something we really need to appreciate especially if we've been orienteering for a long time we're stuck in a certain way of thinking about the challenge and that might be not not at all the way that a newcomer would think about the challenge so i yeah. think that's i think it's great advice yeah cool well thank you very much for sharing that uh, sharing these courses with us and i hope people can gets value cool. out of the experience you've had over the last seven years, setting tw 20 odd courses <laughs> over a few weeks per week. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was quite a lot, but it was fun. And it, hopefully it got lots of kids and people into orienteering, which it did. We got a lot of success coming yeah, through the school series. So absolutely. we got some really, really like just solid orienteers. So that's good. Cool. Thanks Renee. All right, bye. I'll see you downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting to hear from someone who obviously has set enough courses that they've made a lot of the mistakes that we see in course setting. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of time. And I've done the same as well. I've done a lot of course setting in the forest. And sometimes you spend a lot of time doing training for yourself and a group of more experienced orienteers and then you go back to course setting and you don't have the appropriate difficulty dialed in. So it's, it's something that we all need to keep working on. And it's inevitable that the more course setting you do, you'll, you'll eventually have a few, uh, a few bummers, either too hard or too easy or just some oversight, but we can all get better. And I think learning from every course setting you do by getting the feedback and looking to see if the, the experience of the runners uh, met with the expectations they had. So not just is the winning time about right, but what was the experience of, of the runners out there? And is it beating, I think, the 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 kind of experience they wanted to have for orienteering, which isn't all competition. Yeah, it, uh, Renee is quite good at drilling down into what are some of the things that she sees as limitations on courses. Uh, I, I imagine everyone's got a different style with their course setting and I think she was able to explain that reasonably clearly. I think some of the things that really stood out to me were comments on the value of leg length changes. And um, that was something which was mentioned a few times. And mm -hmm. um, the other one was trying to look at an area as a whole and how you're going to utilize it rather than getting too hung up on individual legs. Um, and yeah, it was, I, I think there's a lot of parallels in that course setting as there is with orienteering itself where you're kind of chasing the perfect run when you're orienteering, you're kind of chasing the perfect course when you're setting. Um, that's part of what passion is in orienteering, right? Trying to find, chase the impossible. Yeah, I share that same experience with course setting as well. Every time before I do course setting, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be good. This is gonna be the best. <laughs> and you get that same experience at the end where you're like, ah, that wasn't perfect. <laughs> there were all, there's always things you miss. You wanna show but, us some examples? You've got yeah. some maps that we can talk about. And I think let's, Let's try and hone in on, on a training setup. So this would be useful for people who are looking to set a course for an event, yep. but also uh, so easy to set courses and set trainings. These are some 
little hints for setting a sprint training exercise. Yeah, let's get into it. So one of the things Renee was talking about is first describe the characteristics of the area. And I think this is one area where you can clearly see that there's lots of small buildings. And so the way that you utilize this area should involve, I think, a, a lot of sh shorter controls and twisting and turning. Uh, if the runner's trying to go fast, then you want to give them as much thinking as possible and don't just give them the chance to simplify and run out and around all of the buildings. So uh, I think so that, this that, is that's a good... the point of Renee's where it's know the terrain, be willing to adapt the style of course you normally do to suit the terrain. Loads of buildings, loads of short core, short legs, mm -hmm. maybe bigger buildings, go for those longer road choices. Yeah, and so I think these guys have done it. Okay, this is a race from early this month at the Southern O Week. And you can see that most of these buildings have kind of been identified as the obstacle of the leg. And then there's an option to go one way or the other way. And that can get the, the downside, and I'm, I'm just being um, critical to show uh, kind of both sides of the coin here, is if it, it sometimes just gets a little too too obvious or it's it's not necessarily obvious that one way is faster, but it's obvious that it's 50-50 and therefore it doesn't really matter which way you go. And so the mistake can actually be it's just setting a whole lot of 50-50 route choices where there's, there's really no punishment for not paying more attention to the map because you go one way or the other. So that's the downside of, of doing that kind of course setting and maybe we'll there, take a- there isn't a the contrary to that, though, is there is an intensity that comes with that. If yep. every leg you're having to do a 50-50, um, yep. you can unnerve runners and add that extra urgency and force mistakes. So, yes. yeah. Yeah, especially with these these little buildings. You've got to keep count. And just looking at the map for five seconds and you've, you've missed, a, missed the gap. So, yeah, you've got you've got both, both those two aspects there to consider. And, ch and varying the leg length is, is a really important part of not making it too repetitive. Okay, so that, that's Southern Oak. That's a pretty cool map. I didn't actually run, but yeah, interesting. And where about is this one? Arda. Uh, this, this is, is also Southern Oak. Yeah, this is another um, Southern Oak one um, held by Papo in Christchurch. Very different style of map, right? This one is more of that big building, and you can see how the style of course setting has changed. Yeah, so yeah, on this, you've got some, some chunkier buildings and the, the legs are a little bit longer and so you can you're, you're going a little bit wider and I think it's a bit it's less intense for sure but then the root choices are a little more uh, important they can have a bigger impact on the leg so for example thinking uh, if we go uh, four we're going four to five here um, there's there's a few obviously there's this big building to go around and if you just take a little glance and maybe you just see that there's a building there and you think, okay, it's 50, 50 around the big bit, but you haven't really like articulated this area well enough. And so maybe you come into there and just get slowed down by that when really just simplifying and going around everything is much easier. So there's, there's a slight, a slight difference there. Um, this is maybe more characteristic of the smaller buildings where you're just weaving through, but these bigger blocks, you've, you've got to make sure because the legs are longer, if you do end up making, thinking a decision is 50-50 when it's not, that could be 10, 15 seconds loss because you've had to run much wider than, than what you expect, but it's less intense. And I think it maybe feels a bit easier overall. Okay, so the, the key take home from this really is whether you're setting a race or a training, first of all, just understand a little bit about what the terrain you've got like and what other key problems you're going to be generating have you got big buildings, big obstacles, maybe with longer legs, or are you in quite a detail rich map where you might need to have loads of shorter legs um, and trying to bury if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely from a course any perspective, putting short legs on, on this is not going to, is really going to be that stimulating. Uh, Can I, we just hone in on the top left part of the map where there's all those little walls. This is something I wanted to talk about with, and especially with reference to training exercises, because this is an area which has a lot of stairs, level changes, and is going to need to require checking control descriptions. 
Do you, do you have anything that you can recommend for setting a training session that might help hone that matching of control descriptions to map in an area like this? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So often on training, we don't actually use the control descriptions. And I think that's a, a big mistake, especially for sprint orienteering. And I think we should get used to always using control descriptions for sprint orienteering. And the other side of that, in order to make the control descriptions actually relevant, you do have to set controls in a location where the runner will lose if they don't know exactly where the control is. So for example, having a control placed here, imagine a control circle there, you know, centered on that side of the wall, you need to know that the control description would show um, the symbol for wall and it would have um, may maybe it would be, you know, it would have the inside corner corner symbol um, with the wall and getting, getting, knowing the descriptions. So those, maybe those who don't do red don't understand this little graphic here, but knowing where the control flag is, is placed on the feature is crucial for sprint orienteering. Um, okay. So that's, can, a, that's another thing to add to your training is trying to add control descriptions in. And if you're lucky enough to have an area like this with dead ends, steps, walls, it's the ideal place. I can think in, of yeah. the sprint maps I'm familiar with. There's loads of little areas that should lend themselves well to this. Yeah. yeah what about when it, comes to, when it comes to fairness and these these here, do you have any, do you know of any guidelines around setting in these areas or is it just a case of make yeah. sure your description's accurate, make sure your map's accurate? Yeah, from my experience, the rules are not perfect well they're not all encompassing and there's definitely ways to place a control in a location where the description leads to some ambiguity and so a good course setter and a, a good controller of course if it's a race the controller should be experienced enough to be the voice of the runner and the voice of the orienteer and say hey that's ambiguous I, I don't think that's acceptable if you're just sitting training obviously you can you can push the boundaries a little bit and maybe it's a good learning point to actually put orienteers through something that's ambiguous just so they can see what it feels like to be told that it's at like a wall building junction. And then when you get there, the whole thing looks like a wall because you can't actually tell if a wall is the edge of a building or is it actually just a freestanding wall. So yeah, I think it's good to use areas in training that are ambiguous and see, see both sides of that situation choose some ambiguous ones and also choose some where it's complex like this but um, unambiguous so the control flag is there's only one possible place where the control flag should be placed and it's very obvious upon looking at the control descriptions how the flag is positioned in the terrain in the center of the circle cool it's um that is a good little area on that map there what do you have any other courses or, sh or yeah. do we want to talk about other sprint formats yeah, I think we'll, we'll try to tackle kind of both at the same time. There'll be little nuggets that I think will, will crop up, but I think we'll jump across to a sprint relay training. So another way to tackle sprint orienteering uh, is to mass start people. And now that there's a sprint relay format that's competed in around the world, that's directly applicable now. It's not just to increase the intensity and increase the psychological stress. It is directly applicable to race day. So here we've got a course that I actually uh, ran uh, in in this area. <clears throat> uh, this is not 2015 Sprint Relay Training Tuesday. Yeah, this is this is a training that I think was done on. Um, I don't know if this is the the real map, but it was it's just a good picture that I found online of a, a Sprint Relay training um, that had been done <clears throat> and. So sprint relay, just like a forest relay, mass start at the beginning, but the difference at the at what? Because it's two men, two women, right? Yep. So it goes uh, woman, man, man, woman, and there's a lot of runners very close together. So it's it's very stressful out on the terrain, and you you get these situations where you have these these splits in in the course. And at first, it might not seem like a big split. And often in a forest, you can 
everyone can be running together. And if they've got splits, people will eventually kind of veer off, get their individual controls and maybe join back together at some stage. But let's just take a, take a closer look at, at some of these controls because you'll see that if you were to just be following someone into some of these, then you can get completely destroyed because if you're supposed to be going to 31 and you follow someone through to 32, then they duck in and get the control and you've, you can't just duck across to 31. You're actually bleeding lots of time. Same applies for these guys here. If you're just running as a pack and you turn in with the bunch, the three people you're with um, and, you know, and they get this control because that's what they were supposed to be getting. And you're supposed to be coming down to this one. You know, you're, you're 20 seconds down because because uh, you've you've gone down the wrong the wrong alleyway, so I think that's a really important stress for people to be doing in sprint orienteering. It makes you so much more precise. Yeah, interesting. And I guess that would be a, in a great way to do a a training for distraction as a group. Put together a, a sprint relay or even a mass start sprint with some forking like this. Yeah, maybe a little bit more labour intensive than your normal sprint course, but would would definitely stress the mind in a different way, really yeah. having to ignore the, the potential distraction of other runners. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. When it, comes, when it comes to sprint relay, do you think that there are certain terrains that are better suited to the relay than others? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. There's, there's a bit of a problem as in that there's a, a big difference between the terrains that we have in New Zealand. We have a lot of stuff that's, it's more like this. And so we get kind of used to doing a lot of orienteering sprint or sprint relay and these kind of campus terrains. Whereas a lot of the terrain that they've used for sprint relays hasn't been the most interesting. It's been a little lame to say the least in a lot of the terrains that we've been given, even on the like the world stage. So it's hard to tell whether that's just the the more European style or whether there's other factors that are coming into play when they choose some of these areas. I'd, I'd like to see a few, a few done on really, really hard maps. I think that's the better orientation that we're going for, but we have seen a trend of some of the sprint relays being on the easy side. Yep. Um, now sprint relay isn't the only new discipline. We've also got uh Knockout sprint, which is we do. moving, become more and more popular. Yeah, so knockout sprint is is new, and it's really starting with the elite level runners at the moment. So it's it's a discipline that's I think going to um, trickle along to everyone else. But it's it's really been tried with the elites first, uh, which is interesting, and it's really come about from the necessity to have a full program for the sprint walk, sprint world orienteering champs, where they're having three or four sprint disciplines all competed, uh, all, um, lined up together. And so every second year is sprint world champs. And then every other year is the kind of forest world champs. So minus the, the sprint orienteering. Whereas prior to, prior to last year, it was all kind of combined into into one with a sprint and a sprint relay, but the program was, I think, a bit too hard for countries to organize with so many high profile races. So they've split it and they found that knockout sprint is the discipline that's going to get inserted. So here we have an example of a, uh, the, there's a decision that has to be made at the start of your knockout sprint race. You get 20 seconds to choose which map you would like to receive. Now, this is not the whole course. This is just a section of the course, but you can see that there are three variations to choose from and each runner, it's a mass start, the knockout sprint. Each runner, you might have uh, four runners on the start line. You can choose either this route that will be on your course at some stage, or here's a slightly different one, or you can get you can get this guy and you get to decide which, which one you think suits you or which one you think is shortest, which one you think is safest. So it's pretty different. It's quite pretty edgy. And I think it's going to take a bit of time for people to get used to 
uh, this idea of seeing the map before you start. Like it was very eyebrow raising to me to see something like this, but it seems to be gaining traction. What do you so think? Before Tom? the start, you get an option. They say you can choose this, this or this, and then you're issued your map, which has that part of these controls somewhere in the course. Is that right? That's right. And the clock starts from when you, you pick up the map and start running. And that's the mass start with everyone else. So you get to see the map at minus 20 seconds. Basically, a, a small sample of the map at minus 20 seconds. Yeah. And then you go and grab the corresponding map. That's right. Yep. Uh, what cross. one would you do out of this? I don't think I know which one I'd do. Yeah. Um, I think I quite like the middle one at the moment. Uh, there seems to be just quite a nice flow through the controls. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what it comes down to quite often is there's not a... a you wouldn't expect there to be a big difference between... The controls because that's why the core setter has set it up in such a way they're not going yep. to make one hugely different to the others what's your favorite i, I quite like a yep. because i think you have a longer first control you should be able to see the b runners and as you punch a you're going to have that target of running back on to the b runners as they get the mm. last couple of controls that's and right. you'll probably see yeah. the b runners coming in as well yeah I, I think that's what i do see to me tempting but i think yeah yeah. I mean, it's hard. I've never done one. I've never done one, so I don't know. Yeah, I haven't actually raced one either. There was one done in New Zealand uh, early in 2020. Uh, I wasn't around for that. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting the chance to do one at some stage. And, yeah, you can see that because they're kind of quite similar. You're looking for some reason for a tie break. And I found, like, a bit of maybe a bit of flow through the controls and you found that a reason that, oh yeah, they'll, I might be able to see the runners when I'm running back onto them. So you're finding yeah. just some reason that resonates with you that, that you can use, but uh, the results so far have shown that there hasn't been any in the courses that I've followed where there's been a, a huge difference, um, a huge noble difference at least. Okay, so what are other methods of training? So we've talked about some of the things that people might need to start thinking about preparing for the future. Mm -hmm. What about like some fundamentals? What about like probably the easiest modern day, uh, modern orienteering training session to set up, the punching grid? That's right. So this is something that we've done a few times before. Just get yourself 25 controls, like a five by five grid and print out little maps like this. Get the sport ident system set up. If your club has a sport agent, ask to borrow it, get 25 controls, put some flags on them, go out in your, someone with a big backyard or a park, maybe set the controls up two or three meters apart. And this practice is two things. There's the orientation, constantly reorientating the map as you turn, turn, turn between all these controls. There's knowing your exit direction. You wanna know which direction you're moving in just as you punch the control. And there's also thinking ahead. So you can kind of knock out some of these controls uh, in a loop in little chunks psychologically. So you can think, okay, I just have to, I have to get this one right. And I know that this is, this one's just diagonal, diagonal to the right. So I, those two just sit in your head as one and one leg mentally. Uh, so, and that's, that's a purely sprint orienteering kind of way of thinking. And then you can get, maybe you can also practice as you come through here, you look you look at this one on the way through so that by the time you punch this one, you're then actually home and dry. So there's a few little things like that that you can practice on a, on a micro scale. And you can just make these harder and harder. You know, there's many, many combinations that you can do on a five by five grid. And hey, just do a four by four. There's even plenty of combinations. And if you're really wanting to get uh, pretty into this then six by six is just so many combinations of little courses like this that that you can do and you can just make them make them as crazy as you want and there's so much twisting and turning and looking to the side looking back at the map keeping everything orientated it's only seconds between each punch really also improves your punching speed yeah there's there's a, a bunch of little things that do this with the old school normal punching <laughs> yeah yeah we've only done this with the like si kind of eight not the S, not the si air cards so there's a lot of court there's coordination at each control as well and you can get that technique 
uh, more finely tuned, but it looks like that's not going to be around for very long anyway. It's just going to be swiping over the top. But while it's still around, it's it's useful, useful to punch. And even the SIR is useful just to get used to how it works. For example, if you're if you've got a little piece like this, one, two, three in a row, you should basically be able to just run flat out from this control here. And you might not even need to swipe your hand over these. You're just running close enough to the control that if the SI is in your right hand. Running and listening. Yeah, maybe you're practicing the listening as well. There's there's a few good things to, to practice. So I think this is right. fun. So we've, talk, we've got some ideas for training. So we've talked about uh, trying to know the area. We're going to set a variety of league lengths, different problems based on different types of terrain. We've talked about some formats. How, how are we going to do this? How do we do this in OCAD? Or what yeah, can we use? so I mean, OCAD is one software people can use. Um, we'll touch on Purple Pen shortly. I kind of use OCAD for everything. I've just always done it. Uh, I, I'm not arguing that it's 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 better, but um, I have good good control. I'm happy in the in the driving seat. Okay, so OCAD, OCAD is, a, is a traditional, more traditional type of orienteering software, which you can be used yeah. to draw, draw maps and also to set courses. That's right. Yeah. It's comprehensive orienteering software, and it's got lots of features. And if you know how to use all the features, it's great. But it's not the nicest kind of. It's a bit clunky slightly if you're not sure where to find things. Slightly esoteric program. Um, it's not free. It's paid. Some clubs will have licenses. Um, so talk to your club. Yeah, that's right. So I'm just going to create a new course. I'm going to call it training. Hold on. Can you whip it up on the screen? Uh, I'm, can't currently looking at the, I'm looking at the uh, punching grid. There you go. All right, so this is okay. This is your basic, this is course setting for OCAD. Yeah, this is okay course setting. So assuming I've got it opened already and I've added uh, added this, this particular map as a background map, then I can go to course and I can create a new course called training. And th this is how I would approach a training exercise. So, okay, so what have we got in this area? We've got some blocky buildings over on the left and we've got some smaller, more compact buildings over on the right. So the way I might want to set a training is maybe we come and we, you know, we can warm up in the car park. It's easy to set up a, a start, you know, map, map pickup just on the side of the car park. And then I'm interested in how can we create a decision off the start line? So I'm not interested in kind of placing a control over here, right? As a first control, uh, we can take a look. I'm just going to add these two into the course and preview it. So it's not interesting. Like if we're trying to set set orienteering for red and orange level orienteers, people who are actively going out and doing training on their own time, then that is not an interesting leg as, as Renee's kind of described. You want to pull it like round to, for example, there. You can't actually go straight because there's a wall. People can can see that you can see the wall in there, Tom. Fine. Yep. Yeah, so you've got to realize that off the bat. You get punished if you don't realize there's a wall there because you come down up in here and then you've got to get back out to the left or or out to the right. All right. What's what's the next league? So there's uh, another, uh, I might, yeah, think, okay, we've got this interesting decision and maybe then I'm going to pull them longer. So let's just throw something over there and see what it looks like first off. So as a as an idea, there's no no harm just throwing a control circle down and seeing seeing what works. If we put it on this edge of the building, the root choice is either to come back out and around. I'll draw these on. So the root choice would be you know out around around like that, or the root comes through comes through like this. And I think you can see from that it's probably not 50-50, is it? It's kind of more obvious to go to go one way than the other way. So what you might do then is to pull, pull the control round to there until it gives you some feeling of it's 50-50 to you. So, I mean, we can, we can move it around and just continue to adjust until you're happy with it. And then where do you go from here? How do you create an interesting leg? 
uh, off the back of of that one and I'm going to say let's just put one there and it's let's just acknowledge that that's also not an interesting leg there's nothing really to go around there's no decisions to make and you might start seeing that this is all about putting controls on the far side of an obstacle and so maybe we we're pulling around into there is that 50 50 no it's too obvious to go to the right uh, maybe there no it's too obvious to go to the left so that's the kind of thought process that i'm doing when i do the sprint orienteering and maybe there's not a good a good way to actually get to that third control where it feels right in which case you probably have to move number two somewhere else and so you're constantly doing this adjusting like is this 50 50 mm -mm. Or not close to 50 50 is it interesting is that an interesting leg is that actually challenging the runner to make a decision where there's a risk of getting it wrong and a risk of being punished for getting it wrong okay. and say you were going to do another idea for a session you could do a little leg like this we say three or four and then have a finish and then do another little partial course like a sprint interval sort of thing yep easy enough to do here and okay yep so you can create uh, shorter courses and either just by adding a finish adding a finish in there and finishing the course Ooh, in the wrong place so yeah this is okay being a little niggly so you can do it like that and what's the nice thing with OCAD is that you can just kind of keep going if you wanted to do do intervals you can just add the continue to add um, starts starts into the into the course so that going from there so that all the runners once you've got a printed map know to stop at that first finish and then restart again from the second one and maybe you do want to create uh, more courses and maybe have a, a training. then add, add in this second part, just on a, a fresh piece of paper and maybe print out two maps. Cool. cool. Awesome. So with- Okay, that's, that's um, okay. What about if you don't have okay? What's another, what's the free option? So I really like Purple Pen. This is another quite good option. I think the software is really nice to use and it's easier to get off the ground. It's easy to get a course on paper. You can't do as many of the tricky things about setting up uh, all kinds of like white out areas and cutting cutting bits off and covering over things and making more doing more of this kind of power user stuff. <clears throat> if you do want to check out Purple Pen, Orientary and Victoria have just done a little tutorial on it. By little I mean <laughs> seventy two minutes, and this is part one of their. Uh, they've got two a two part series on this. And so in this, in this video, they go through how to use purple pen as a software. So it's not about the technical side of course setting. It's about how to use uh, purple pen and they show you how to set up uh, things like relays and these loops and how to add in controls and it can make your life quite easy and you can set courses very fast on purple pen. So I'd encourage you to, um, check out this video here on YouTube. Yeah. So shall we get another, shall we get another perspective on sprint orienteering? Cause I understand you did an interview with Tim Robertson a year or two ago. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the first interviews I did. Um, it was just Tim and I ha having a chat about Tim's uh, introduction to orienteering and why he loves sprint orienteering so much. And of course he, he went on to, get a silver medal at world champs on the back of a number of top 10 placings at world cups and other similarly high profile races. And so I think it's just a great introduction to how he thinks about orienteering and really what his objectives are and the things he enjoys. And also it was cool to hear about his experience when he's orienteering because we all deal with uh, the stress and the pressure of orienteering, especially when you're, 
you know, in front of crowds, we all deal with that quite differently. So I thought this is um, well worth a, a short listen. It was just something we did for the um, community. So it's there to be listened to on um, my YouTube channel. So you can, cool. you can check that out. It should be interesting. So last, let's, um, orienteering hasn't stopped around New Zealand over the last few months. There's been a few happenings around the country. Uh, Southern O-Week was probably the big one. And you've pulled up one of the more, well, they're all pretty interesting, but one of the most interesting courses was on Bottle Lake. And this was a mass start race. Oh, yeah. So this is this is pretty cool. I really love some of the sand dune terrain. There's like really detailed little patches here. Little hills and depressions everywhere. I think this is cool. And what I doubly love about this course is that it's pressurized. It's a mass start. And I think this is a great idea for training as well is to do some of these mass start kind of races because the pressure when you go from training solo to then doing a mass start race, you've got just the press of pressure of race day plus the pressure of other people being around you. And that's a massive jump from doing solo training at a moderate pace. So I think this is really good for people to realize you have to better handle this if you want to do orienteering at a high performance level. And I think it's really empowering when you can come into a race like this, where it's very technically demanding and there's psychological pressure and really come through with a sense of discipline and control. And you didn't just follow people and they got all clustered together and you stayed on your course and you did, did it well and did your best. So I'm very excited to see races like this. Well, what about you, Tom? Yeah, no, I agree. Not, neither of us were able to make it down there, unfortunately, but I think there's something special about a mass start. There are definitely races that, that stick in your mind. Um, Southern O Week, we won't go into massive detail given we weren't there, but orienteering has, has also been happening elsewhere. Orienteering Wellington have gone down the training pathway. They look like they've had a pretty massive training weekend this weekend just gone, if their pictures are anything to go by. Um, yeah, that is quite a collection of, of training maps. So good on them for getting stuck in. And they've got descriptions about what the athletes are doing. And uh, that get, helps to give a lot of focus, both for the people doing the coaching and the participants who are actually doing the orienteering. Training exercises are not just about spending time in the forest. It's about focusing on one particular component of the orienteering technique and just improving that one little bit and then finding another technique and just reinforcing that technique. And it's kind of like bricks in a pyramid. And if you let one of your bricks on the bottom get all crumbly and start to break away, then the techniques above it that depend on that working, they will start to fail as well. And you'll find you have a, if, if those foundations are not constantly polished and uh, tuned up, then you just have problems all over with your orienteering technique. Yeah, so kudos to Orienteering Wellington for having a training weekend. I think it's really cool not just to be racing and do some training instead. Now, another another thing a little different is in my new uh, place of residence in, in the Wa Waikato, uh, using MapRun and embracing technology even post-COVID. So there is uh, the summer series here in Hamilton, and they're continuing to use uh, electronic orienteering on the MapRun app. Here's a screen grab from one of uh, the events i've not tried it to be, to be honest i need to and i mean i'm going to get it next week next wednesday i'll try and get along and give it a try maybe i need a bigger phone though my phone's yeah <laughs> yeah the purist in me doesn't get hugely motivated towards uh towards map run but i can totally see how valuable it is from a club's perspective and i think people should really get clubs should really get involved about utilizing it because it lowers the the overheads for organizing orienteering especially summer you know, the summer nav summer series style orienteering or these these street road gains where the objective from a club's perspective is to introduce new members to navigation give them a challenge that's rewarding and achievable and put minimum uh pressure on the volunteers like we really rely on these volunteers and burning them out over over summer it doesn't really set you up for a good a good season moving forward so i think i'll, re I'll we'll report clubs. back on that i'll report back after i've had a go yeah so this will be interesting to to see more of this more of this happen 
um, I think there's yeah a lot of benefits for for clubs to get stuck in. And uh, closing out in Auckland, they have a very exciting event coming up. I will be doing another race, so I won't be there. But the uh, Riverhead Orienteering Weekend, double header Auckland Orienteering Series on in Riverhead, start of March, uh, will be very fun. And I think it's on a new area. Post- That's right. Post- it is a new area. A lot of a lot uh, similar to um, some of some of the stuff up on the up on the east here. So a lot, a lot of new, a lot of Riverhead has has areas like that, and it's very complementary to the faster sand dunes that we also get in Auckland. And again, it's complementary to some of the the farmland areas with patchy forest. And I think it's also so valuable because of this tough vegetation. We don't often get that, and uh, you can see a little picture of what it's what it's like here. And it's very appropriate for a lot of the stuff you get in Europe where there's a lot of undergrowth. It's very leafy. It's very bushy. It's slapping you in the face the whole time. And just getting used to that feeling and know that you're not going to get defeated by the vegetation. And it's, it is soft enough just to push through and you don't have to get off your bearing. You can just go straight through a lot of this vegetation and yeah, you've got to get used to it. So this is great to see the orphan guys, uh, getting stuck into uh, to some of this terrain that is physically tough and emotionally tough as well. Cool. Nice. So that's about it for, for this month. Just as a parting thought, loads of people, including me, are going to be running summer street series events, taking part over the next few weeks. Gene, what do you recommend for people who want to maximize their navigation mm. training outcomes from one of these runs? How what can you do to make a summer event be most beneficial for your sprint and forest orienteering? What do you reckon? Yeah, that's a really good question because we're just warming up in the season. We're just getting started. We're a long way from anything too serious. So how can we use uh, these, these summer navs to reintroduce us to orienteering and start building those foundational bricks up again that have started to get rusty over summer? The things I like to do when I'm doing these, these summer series and the, these park events is just focus on the good process, just starting from basics again. And for me, the good process is about simplifying each leg and just being religious on the compass, like checking it. Yep, yeah, it's working. I'm going across the park, which I can see it's just a flat field, but, you know, just double checking and, and really doing the good process, no matter how confident you feel about running around your local parks and streets. And you can, you can exaggerate some of that stuff and just kind of treat it like a training, I think, and do more navigation than you absolutely need to pick up all the little trees and just become really one with the map, even though it's not really necessary. So you you reckon try and read, read more detail and try and make it a little bit more difficult for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a feeling of, oh yeah, I'm confident. I know where the control is going to be. Like this is parks and roads and stuff. And once we feel that sense of confidence, the brain switches off. There's nothing really that can go wrong. So it's kind of trust the process, try and as best you can recreate the mental processes you'll be doing out in the forest or on a sprint course. Exactly, exactly. You're trying to recreate a mental process that's appropriate for what will be coming later in the season. And the alternative to that, I think, is, is practicing bad process. It's feeling so confident and relaxed and you can just cruise around the streets and get, you know, this reward for the, you get the control perfectly without even paying that much attention. So I think if anyone is wanting to use uh, the summer nav and park events, that, that kind of stuff at the start of a, a longer season, then you can, you can use those things to your advantage. You've just got to up the ante mentally and yeah, exaggerate good process. Nice. Cool. All right. Well, that's us for another month. Uh, we will be back maybe a bit earlier in Feb uh, to have a bit of a talk about things orienteering and navigation related. Thanks, Gene. See you mid-Feb. Thank you, Tom. If you liked the show, please support it by sharing this podcast with one person who would benefit from it. The best place to find more content like this is at genebeverage.nz where you can find years of training blogs, race reports, podcasts and coaching videos. 
If you don't want to miss future episodes, I recommend subscribing to my newsletter by visiting genebeverage.nz or by following on social media, Perfect Flow on Facebook and Gene Beverage on Instagram. For Q&A, send messages to nav at perfectflow.nz.